Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. The honor today to have Pernilla Quadfort with us from Lidlöping University in Sweden. And she's been doing some very interesting work on um, getting a sense for patterns of, of, of visual attention um, on objects uh, as users work with computing systems. Um, I think they reveal uh, quite a bit, well, they show the direction for that kind of revelation about uh, human cognition. So, Pernilla. Thank you very much. So, uh, my title of my work is Eyes on Multimodal Interaction. And I did this work while I was a graduate student at the Department of Information and Computer Science in Linköping University. Although I was actually not there because I did this work in cooperation with IBM Almaden Research Center in San Jose. So, um, the motivation for this work is that um, my group that I work with in Linköping is trying to move the interaction away from making commands to have a dialogue-based interaction. And when thinking about this, I realized that when we are talking to people in face-to-face, -face, there seems to be a lot going on with our eye gaze. We can see if people are interested or not interested, if they are listening to you and not listening to you. And so I have uh, two examples of this. This is two women. They are cooperating with a couple of, of notes that they are sorting here on the table. And you can see that this woman is looking at an area down here somewhere, while this other woman, she's looking at her eye gaze to see if they sort of are looking in a similar direction, if they are talking about the same kind of sets of notes on their shared workspace. And <clears throat> here is another example. And in this example, we have two girls. And this girl is telling about this little creature, or robot, actually, that she has built, and how it's functioning and going to work. And you can see on this eye gaze that, that this girl is very interesting in what is going on over there. And <clears throat> when we are moving from commands to dialogue-based interaction, it is interesting to see when um, now we are talking about computer. So when the uh, face of our partner is not only the, the face, but also the interface, how can we use eye gaze to infer information? Um, and what kind of information is there? So, and when we look at uh, multimodal in interfaces, most work has been done on speech and pointing or speech and input case uh, interaction. And these are starting to come near commercialization. And there is more um, experimental work on speech and gesture and how to coordinate that. And this one drives it even further in a new direction where we can combine speech and gaze into the user interface. When we look at how eye gaze has been used in multimodal interaction before, we can distinguish two parts. One is for using, mutual, using it for doing mutual disambiguation of the speech channel and the eye gaze. So both this work of Tanaka and Zhang et al, they look at uh, objects on the screen and you're supposed to sort of say which object you want to select. So the green triangle, for example. And, um, the other lines of research is sort of trying to look at the complementary. So uh, Jai et al. used uh, speech and, no, not speech, mouse movement and eye gaze in order to sort of select objects on the screen. And Cardal used speech and eye gaze to sort of complement the two channels. So they said move it there and they looked at the object they wanted to select and, and where it was supposed to go. What these two have in common is that they are using, they are basing their interactions on command, and it's not based on dialogue. And I wanted to move a little bit further. I want to go towards dialogue. And the first research, <coughs> the first I did was to try to look at what kind of past research 
is there what do we know about the connection between the spoken interaction and the, um, the eye gaze. And we can see that there has been mainly been three lines of research. There has been pe people has looked at how does eye gaze matter in face-to-face in -face communication? And how is the eye positioning when speaking and listening? And finally, about eye gaze and shared spaces. And when we look at the face-to-face -face communication, we can see that this research is mainly focused on the timing between the gaze, the mutual gaze, and the utterance. So for example, in the beginning of the utterance, one tend to look away, to look back, and for at the end of the utterance, you sort of hand over the term by, look, uh, by looking at somebody. And uh, for the eye gaze position when speaking and listening, the aim of this research is to understand the cognitive processes. And by that, they're trying to figure out how long time does it take to retrieve um, a word from, from your memory. So, so you sort of uh, ask people to look at objects and, and name them. And they can say that, oh, approximately 900 milliseconds before they say the word, they look at the word. And approximately 600 milliseconds after they hear um, a word, they look at the object on the screen corresponding to the word. And uh, also in the eye gaze and shared spaces, the idea here is trying to communicate a joint attention. When two persons, presumably uh, not located together, are communicating, which kind of objects are they interested in? And can eye gaze be used to communicate this? Excuse me. And the work that has been shown in that area is that, yes, it's possible to do that. Uh, but pointing works as well. So it's not that they haven't really been able to show a great sort of influence on just showing the position of the eye gaze to the communication partner. And we can see that the implications from past research is that the uh, utterance and the gaze, they are coordinated behaviors. Gaze can be used as a mean for grounding, so to check that we are understanding each other, and uh, that we are talking about the same thing. And eye gaze can fu also function as a pointer to objects. We can sort of select to, to, to look at the share if we want to. And we can also say that eye gaze patterns are related to speech. However, this uh, past research is quite limited. It either shows very general phenomena with limited applicability to multimodal interaction, or it studies speech and gaze in a very limited setting, such as these cognitive studies, where you have a few items on the screen, you have pre-recorded utterances, that the speaker or listening are, or format that the speaker is supposed to follow. So this information that we know from past research is clearly not enough for building multimodal system. So what we did was that, in cooperation with, with IBM, uh, we did a study of natural eye gaze patterns and we call it the real tourist study. So we had one tourist and we had one tourist consultant and they were not located to, to each other. They were not located so they could see each other, but uh, they saw the same map over here. And the tourist eye gaze was recorded by this two big eye tracker up here, which has the eye tracker integrated with the screen. And the tourist <coughs> consultant had this view it could see the map, it could see an indicator of the tourist eye gaze, and it had some information about the different sort of places on the map. And I can show you a quick example of what the tourist saw, so you get a feeling of it. Unfortunately, there is no sound on this one since I took it directly from the screen. Whoops.
Uh, can't you play this one? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know it. Try right clicking on the image. Maybe. Hmm. No. I think I had a trick the last time. There we go. There you go. <laughs> so you see how, how it sort of moves between the different places. We had a, a small recursive filter on this one, so sort, sort of trying to calm down a little bit of the high speed eye movements. But this is uh, uh, the view that, that sort of the tourist consultants saw. So the user is, whoops, this is the wrong one. The, uh, whoops, now it, um, yeah, it comes here. So um, what the tourist is trying to do, he's trying to book a conference trip. So he has some uh, constraints like price limit, location constraints, and personal preferences that he could sort of select on. So, so it says that, oh, the company is not prepared to pay more than $150 per night and that sort of thing. <laughs> and, oh, it should be close to the conference center, and <laughs> like that. <laughs> and then we had uh, 12 tourists, and we have two tourist consultants. And we asked the, the uh, uh, tourists to do two trip planning tasks. And then we collected the eye gaze data. We collected the spoken dialogue, which was synchronized with the eye gaze. And we had uh, the video film of the tourist consultants' faces, so we could see if they looked at the information or if they looked at the map. I'm just curious, I mean, if, uh, yeah? if the tourist actually doesn't have any focus on whatever he's doing, just, you know, you know taking a break or something, how, how will the gaze look like? Is that going to be a random pattern or something? Um, I'm coming to, to that a little bit. Oh, I, okay. I, I, yeah. Um, but in general, I, I could say that uh, since this is a very task-oriented dialogue, uh, you could sort of see they, they, their eye gaze was related to the task almost all the time. Yes? Kind of at a higher level, um, I'm still unclear about what you're really interested in. Are you interested in, in, in modeling human-human dialogue? Are you interested in... I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, right. yeah. So my primary interest is trying to, to see if there is some eye gaze information that we can use in the multimodal system, that is building a system that uses eye gaze or information from eye gaze to interact with the user. Or okay, so if this is all geared towards trying to find like yes. some basis for creating a, a multimodal system between humans and a computer, where the computer is using vision. Yeah, so I tried, in, in this study here, I tried to create a, a setting that's similar to a multimodal information system, where you're sort of talking to the system and the system tracking your eyes. Um, and one other question. What do you mean by dialogue? What is dialogue for you? Okay, so uh, a command is more like, uh, put that one there. Right. But if I so dialogue is more, more say, question answering, so how far is it from the conference center to this hotel and, or, and how much does it cost and this sort of thing. But if, if you ask a question and I ask you a clarification, like, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Is that a dialogue? Um, yeah, together. Give me a command and, and I ask you, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Can you repeat that? Is that considered? Well, yeah. So in, in a dialogue, you can have utterance of different types. And of co course, in the dialogue, you can have command type utterances. Yeah, that's, that's true. But it's not. Yeah. So, uh, and the purpose in here was that since we didn't have enough information from previous research, we have to do something ourselves. And we could see that there were several things that the tourist consultant could use the eye gaze information for. And that was resolving references, resolving ambiguities, uh, make some interest detection, detect when there was a topic switch coming up, or, or using the eye gaze information for making topic shifts, and also for establishing common ground, which one could see as a sum of all of those. Well, well clarification question. Did, did yes. The, did the, um, Tourists know that their gaze was being tracked by the uh, expert. Uh, they they know uh, that the tour that the tourist 
that their gaze was tracked. They could actually use the gaze in an artificial way. Like, I mean, but they didn't know when the choice consultant saw it. I see. Okay. So we already know that eye gaze can be used for pointing. Right. So we sort of, what other kind of eye gaze pattern might we find there that are connecting with the speech? And the gaze, was, the gaze the result was hidden from the user. Was it shown also to the user? Their gaze was not shown. Yeah, no. So, so the tourist only saw a regular map, and occasionally the tourist consultant could display uh, um, an image of of, a, of of the hotel or the attraction they were talking about. So, when we're looking at at resolving references and ambiguities, and one reason why the tourist consultant could use this is that people tend to look at what they talk about. And I have two examples of this. So I will show the example first, and then uh, I'll sort of tell you what is going on. And in both these examples, it's the tourist voice and eye gaze that we see. And it has a different visualization, because this is from the analyzing tool, and I didn't have the dot moving. Instead, it's a line that moves. And what's in the uh, the Arden Forest? There's Moose House, there's Gamlia, and there's Arboretum. So we can see that uh, the tourist, in this case, he says the name of these four different places: the Arden Forest, the, the Moose House, Gamlia, and and Arboretum. And at the same time, we can see that eye gaze moves from, or slightly, actually slightly before. The eye gaze moves from one place to, to another. And the most current um, position of the eye gaze is the most reddish part, while this more pinkish is sort of shows it's a trace of the history. Do that again? Yes, so I'll do it again. So if first say the Arden Forest, sort of looks at it a little bit first, and then it goes to the Moose House, Gamlia, and Arboretum. And we'll show it again. And what's in the uh, the Arden Forest? There's Moose House, there's Gamlia, and there's Arboretum. So we can see that, that the eye gaze give an early indication of which places he's going to talk about. Right, because eye gaze is it's ahead of it. Right? It's ahead of speech, yes, slightly. I didn't measure exactly how much it is in, in, in this setting. Um, what else? Maybe because he doesn't remember the name of the face, he has to look at the face name. Exactly what I was going to say. So I have another example of that, which shows that it's not only that. It's, <laughs> it's more than that. Okay. Um, so in this, no, that's the wrong one. I have to. So in this example, um, Instead of saying the, the, the name of the place, he's referring back to, to a tell. I'm all set, and I would like to make a reservation for the hotel we just discussed. OK. So in this case, we see that his eye gaze is very much focused all the time at this hotel. Well, make a short detour there, but return to, to this hotel. And this is the hotel that they discussed. They left that hotel to talk about some restaurants. If there were, any. He wanted to know if there was any restaurant close by before he actually booked that hotel. I'll, I'll show that again. So what are these long, long lines? OK, so this, this it's, it's a history of the eye gaze. Oh, it's OK. So you keep. So this up, up here, it's most reddish. That's the current location. And this pink here is the oldest location. I'm all set, and I would like to make a reservation for the hotel we just discussed. OK. So we see that it's not only that when saying the names of the objects, but also referring to them by, by different referring expressions that they also use the eye gaze to sort of look at what they are talking about. <clears throat> yes. OK. We can also see that. <clears throat> the eye gaze is used for establishing a common ground, that is assessing the partner's understanding, has, has he followed my instructions? 
and making sure that they are sort of talking about the same thing. They are still talking about this hotel that was closest to the conference center or whatever. And I have an example here of assessing the partner's understanding. So in this is a still image of the user's eye gaze. So it starts up with a square and ends here with a circle. And during this sequence, the tourist consultants say that the eastern part of the city has, I can see first the tourist moves oh, west and then it goes back to east. And here the eastern part of the city. Now, the tourist consultant realized, oh, this was actually not what I was, why well, I said the wrong thing. So, oh, no, the western part of the city. And from starting over here, the tourist consultant follows. The tourist follows with her, his eye gaze, where the tourist consultant is sort of aiming with his speech. So, <clears throat> since the tourist is following the directions of the tourist consultant, the tourist consultant can confirm that he has exactly understood what is going, that the tourist has understood what the instructions given. <clears throat> we can also see that it could be used for adapting the conversation to what the tourist looked at or the sort of inferred information need based on the eye gaze. So in this case, um, the tourist sees that the tourist is talking about a restaurant up there at Cornelius Street. And he says, so that is a pretty good choice. And then he makes a pause. And then he sees that the, eye, the tourist eye gaze is moving here from the conference center, approximately along the yellow bus route. And then he says, oh yeah, you can take the yellow bus line. It's quite accessible. And those were subjects. Uh, these were uh, tourists that were trained on, on doing this kind of task. Oh, but they actually were? They were not real tourist consultants. Right, but, yeah. but they actually people in a new town that are interested in these, actually interested in these things, or are they making believe they were interested in these things? They were making believe that they were interested in, in this. But they, they were amazingly in, in trying to, to get their best choice in the best hotel that sort of was closest to the the, the, the official price limit and, and all these kinds of things. So, so they were quite engaged, I can tell you, although they, they, it was not a real task. They, um. So another thing we could see that eye gaze could be used for by the tourist consultant is to detect if the person was interested or not. And here I should say that, well, um, conversations are different and we know that some people they tend to sort of talk a lot while other people's not talking a lot. So sometimes the tourist consultant were uh, driving the conversation more and sometimes the, the tourist sort of ask questions. Oh, well, what about this? What about that? And especially when the tourist consultants were um, driving the conversation, you could see that you could have this interest detection um, that they used. And one thing that indicated interest was that they have a high intensity. So on um, the objects that the tourist consultant talked about. So this image um, showed the fixation of 15 seconds. And that's pretty long when it comes to eye gaze. And during this 15 seconds, we can see that almost exclusively the tourist is looking at this image. And I don't have the real image here, but I can tell you it's not very interesting. It's a the front of a canoe between two boats and a little bit of water and forest in the end. But he looks 15 seconds on that one. He goes up and then he goes down here again. And up there is the location from where you can take a canoe trip. So in that rectangle, there was an actual day thing now the picture. This is the, 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 the picture inside this rectangle. Yes. And, um, so high intensity is clearly showing a high interest. He also ended up asking for, uh, to sign up for a canoe trip. Mm -hmm. So he was clearly interested in, in this. And the eye gaze can sort of come in. He didn't say much. And I can tell you, after the tourist consultant saw this, and after 15 seconds, she continued talking about the, um, um, the canoe trip. Is that, is that slide? So the 
defining high intensity, you mentioned it well in 15 seconds in Fox, but is it also defined by like, how many saccades or other kinds of statistics? Uh, well, I haven't sort of. So right now you're looking at just to total time. Just total sort of intensity on, on, on that one, yeah. And we can see that usually one say that uh, a fixation is about 200 milliseconds, and that's, that's around what, what they are, so. It's not like they're making a whole lot longer fixations or that sort of thing. It's the same. Um, on the other hand, we can see that, that we have a low intensity that the trace consultants are not very interested. OK. And in the next example, it's the trace consultant that starts talking. And then uh, we see the trace eye gaze. And eventually, he asks a question. Now I overshoot again. There we go. So I'll first play it for you, and then I'll describe what's going on, and then I'll play it again. Okay. So for example, we have the lobster house. It's right along the ocean. It has uh, seafood, and uh, it's a very novel fish restaurant. Um, so they have a variety of, of rare fish and uh, sh what, what okay what, what tell me about the um, something near the fisherman wharf oh so in this case the, the tourist consultant starts talking about this restaurant the tourist sort of briefly checks it in the, in the image uh, realize that this is not very interesting so he moves over here, searching for new places, places that they have not talked about earlier. Don't find anything interesting over there. Then moves up there, find Fisherman's Wharf, and starts sort of checking out things. So here we see um, that the, the low interest is sort of indicating that he's sort of moving on in the conversation. He's going to talk about something new. Um, so, I play it again. Okay. So, for example, we have the lobster house. It's right along the ocean. It has uh, seafood, and uh, it's a very novel fish restaurant. Um, so, they have a variety of, of rare fish. And, uh, sh what, what, okay, what, what tell me about the something near the Fisherman Wharf? Oh, so, yeah. How many subjects are you running? I was running 12, 12 subjects here. Um, so, and... So, yep. with, with that last example, I didn't quite understand. It almost seemed as though he was confused, because at the very end he said, so we're talking about the Fisherman Wharf here? No, so he said, oh, so uh, what, uh, what about Fisherman's Wharf? Is there anything interesting? Okay. So, yeah, it's, sometimes it's, uh, so it's, it's not so much that he's confused about it. So, um, and, uh, well, these two patterns, we have either high intensity or very low intensity. And it sort of says, well, is, is this the only thing that's going on? And no, that's not true. There is an, sort of another pattern that we can see. And that is intensity on related object. And this is also around 15 or 20 seconds. I don't remember 15, I think. And you can see here is much more spread compared to the first one with high intensity that I showed. But when we look at what is the objects that he looks at, so the tourist consultant is talking about, I think it's um, the moose house up on the top, and uh, has previously talked about Gamlia. We can see during this time the tourist consult, the tourist looked at Gamlia. He looks at the bus routes, the bus terminal, and the image, and, and some other places too. But these are clearly sort of related places to, to the, the current topic. It's 
places we talked about previously, and it's places that has to do with communication to get to that place up there north. So it almost looks like the tourist is sort of um, considering going to the Mo's house and then doing both Mo's house and Gamli or something like that. We can also see that um, there we can detect, uh, we can see relationship between two places. So in this case, um, the tourist consultants, well, um, during this time, I think it's 4.7 seconds or something <coughs> like this, tourist consultant says, yeah, there is a fishing company that's called Rolf's Fishing at Fisherman's Wolf. It's also the image up in the corner that's shown that. They can, uh, you can go with them at 6 o'clock. And here we see a lot of fixa we see fixation on the Fisherman's Wharf and on the hotel here. And it goes back and forth. And after this, the tourist asked, how can I walk between the Fisherman's Wharf and my hotel? I mean, uh, how long does it take? So he's clearly interested in sort of distance relation between these two places. And we could see that this one, this pattern, several locations. So yes. were they just done in the areas with the least amount of um, map information, or was the travel consultant deliberately placing them out of the way of the things where the tourist was looking? Um, the the images was placed sort of in an area that didn't wouldn't obstruct the map, okay. and it was always the same place for for different cities. Okay. Yeah. So we can see that the implications from this research for multimodal interaction is that we can see that we can use eye gaze uh, for solving references and resolving ambiguities, for doing topic switching and interest detection. And we can see that um, we can either use it to increase recognition accuracy on the speech channel or we can use it for managing the dialogue. So it's these two fits. Coming from a, um, a group that does a lot of dialogue modeling, this was, of course, a little bit more interesting. So that was the next thing I did. So <clears throat> in this eye tourist, so I built this eye tourist system that is an eye gaze based interactive system, sort of trying to, to uh, see how much, well, we know now that there is information in an eye gaze, but how much is there and how much can we sort of stress it? And in this case, uh, we had the same kind of task, except with, that we replaced the tourist consultant with the uh, computer, uh, computer system, with a box, so to say. And we used, I chose to use a fairly simple algorithm, and the goal was to test the feasibility of managing human-computer dialogue based on the eye gaze movement. And uh, I used both eye tracking and mouse input, uh, but I mainly um, asked them to, to use the mouse to correct when something was not going as they intended the tourists. And I used two scores to determine their sort of interest in the, the objects. The interest, score, the interest score and the focus interest score, I'll come back to those one a little bit later. And I in integrate this in the Event and Interaction Manager this sort of control which kind of speak and output and image display that we should have. And we had a bunch of objects <clears throat> and we also, well, uh, the system sort of talked about the places to, that you were interested in and while doing this we had a sort of, um, when they talked about the hotel, it showed the facade of the hotel and the rooms and the restaurant while talking about the breakfast and that sort of thing. Is the camera mounted on the monitor there? It's mounted below. It's sort of hard to see, but oh, okay. there's a little bit here. And then there is some, some panels for infrared light sitting on the sides, below, and on the top. So if people are interested, uh, to bring up to our usability lab, we have a later version of this upstairs. So yeah. yeah. That's nice one. A bunch of studies and so on. Yeah, it's a, it's a Swedish eye tracker, so it's a little bit ironic that I should travel half around the world to use a Swedish eye tracker. Yeah. And I could travel 200 kilometers. Okay, well, 
uh, Ed Cutrell, you know, he uh, diverted a whole bunch of them and we chose that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so sweet. So. Yeah. So I said that there were two scores. So we had the uh, interest score, which is the uh, I score, which was used to activate an object. And the base, as we saw before showing the interest, is the gaze intensity. And then we used um, four different factors to sort of modify this uh, gaze intensity. And um, two of these factors sort of roll uh, the category and the history sort of models the task, or if you want, the dialogue, which is sort of similar in this context. So the, the relevance is that if you have been talking about a hotel, until you have decided which hotel to stay on, it's likely that the next place is another hotel. Um, and we can also, the activation history. So if, if you have uh, listened to the information about one particular hotel, you are not very likely to being interesting in that one once more again. And one thing that we saw in the other study was that people tended to return to, they also do that in this case for this restaurant here. This is from using the study, using the eye tourist. They tend to return to their gaze to the, the restaurant or the, the object, the place that they are interested in. So that is the, the um, so we model that in, in frequency of re-entries. And <clears throat> then we also had the object size. Since I use some squares with a little bit extra around here, uh, we can see that, for example, this one has a lot of I dots. And some hits the botanical garden, although there is no fixation over there. So it's not probably some eye tracking inaccuracy going on there. Uh, and this larger object, of course, attracts more of these random dots, random samples. So uh, we sort of gave the larger object, made it, them a little bit harder to activate. Could you have zero objects active at once? I mean, yes. And could you have two? No, it's only one, because the system can only talk about one at, at one point. But it could talk about, um, I'm coming a little bit, but that lady could say distances between the two objects. So in that case, we just activate one after the other. Um, in that case, I'm going to talk about a little bit how he, it, it works in order to sort of trigger the the distance utterances. Okay. Okay. So distance utterances basically say either how long does it take to walk between them or how um, how you go with bus if it's longer than 30 minutes to walk. So the phi score is, is the focus interest score. So the, when the system is talking about the object, is the user still interested in the object? And we can see here, for example, this is from the previous study, that uh, the uh, tourist uh, the tourist consultant is talking about the hotel, and the tourist looks at the conference center and um, also briefly at the restaurant up there. So it's clear not only the intensity on the active object, but also on related object. And related object can be the conference center was related to the, all the hotels, so that was sort of in the task model. But also sort of close by objects were sort of considered. Um, related object. And then we measured these ones over a moving time window and did it. So, so one, might, one might, might make the argument that the notions of centers around that when you're looking at an object and you have high, higher intensity, whatever you're using for that, yeah. you might want to actually demote objects around it because there's some chance of random, random. talk and, and, and uh, attraction that's not really of interest but just kind of a visual kind of attraction and then uh, um, well yeah but on, on the on the other hand it might still means that you're actually looking at the sort of hotel that you although although might some some dots might go over here you're still sort of interested in the hotel over there so in in I tourist I had a hotel uh, sort of objects that were close by to the ab active object that were, were related in order to sort of 
keep up the intensity of on on this one because you're still sort of interested in that. And I don't remember right now. I guess I'm trying to separate out the likelihood that you'd be interested in related things because they're close by approximately for walking distances and so on. Yeah. From I being drawn randomly to things nearby and um, maybe the domain would highlight that where it wasn't a goodness to closeness in the domain itself. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, do. I think it depends a little bit of what, what kind of sort of domain. In, yeah. And in this case, I could see that there is a natural tendency to sort of look at the, the places that's close by. And that this does not necessarily mean that you are uninterested in the place that, that the system is talking about or, or the tourist consultant was talking about. So, and then as I hinted a little bit earlier, we had the distance uh, detection, which was very crude. Um, so we recorded the eye gaze locations on the different objects and uh, recorded them in the object memory. And then we filtered out short durations. So if we got the random dot here, uh, when the tourist was moving the eye between these two places, um, we sort of took that away. And the bus terminal when was overshoot and that sort of thing. And then we checked if they were looking sort of back and forth between these two places. And one of the places had to be the active object, because otherwise you could get any kind of random uh, two look objects. And we saw from the previous uh, study that they usually tend to, to, look, to talk about distance but for an object that sort of is the focus of the conversation. That the, the conversation is about, the topic of the conversation. So that's sort of some of the constraints we put on that. And then we use these two scores, the I scores and phi score to manage the dialogue. We use it to change the state of the object and to determine what to play and what to show. And we have certain uh, choice points, points here that we use the, the scores. Yeah. With, with the scores, did you uh, um, have any way of knowing what the variance uh, due to noise would be on those scores? And how did you calibrate that? Um, well, I assume that the, even the eye tracker has some noise yes, associated. Yes, yes. And it's uh, depending on different persons. So no, the, the question is no, I didn't do any sort of filtering for noise. That's, of course, possible to do that. but. Um, I can show an image later that sort of show that my system, the, the methods that I use, although simple, and uh, were quite effective for accomplishing what they were supposed to accomplish. How did you set the threshold? What? How did you set, set the threshold? Oh, the, the thresholds in my system right now is, is uh, done by, by pilot's test and, and other kinds of, of base, basic empirically based. This, um, a further development, of course, can be to have a, a machine learning algorithm to sort of update the thresholds and that sort of thing. It's the same is with the different weights on the different factors in the I score and the phi scores. Um, so we did a small user study of the eye tourist uh, to sort of see if it could work, if we could catch the, the eye gaze patterns we were interested in. We have 12 users. They use the same tasks, the same kind of uh, price limits, location, location constraints, and personal preferences. And we collected the eye gaze and the events when the system started talking about an object and if the user clicked at different places. And we video filmed their faces. And we could say, well, it worked. They all successfully completed the task, it didn't give up or anything, and they used very few mouse clicks to correct the system, to correct our tourists. And the task completion time was actually slightly lower than having a human on the other side. Uh, the humans didn't always have, have an easy task uh, doing it, <clears throat> although it's not directly easy to, to sort of correspond, uh, compare the two studies. So the humans were watching those eye traces just going by in real time with no 
ability to do what we did and just look at them again? Um, no, they looked at this dot, the, the moving dot, which was a slightly slower. Okay. So it's a different kind of visualization, but that one was tried out as, as sort of feasible for the human to be able to follow. Um, so, okay, so this is um, an example that sort of show that the same kind of eye gaze pattern is exists here as we find in the first pattern. So although we see that the fixation is quite a bit longer on this object that this uh, user is trying to trigger here, um, you can see that he sort of comes back to it, looks at sort object that's close by but returns to this object, goes back. So we have the re-entry that plays a part in, in indicating if you're interested in an object or not. And the user experience was that uh, the user had quite a positive reaction. It says, oh, I think it's a real pro cool program. I mean, it tracks down what you think and what you want. I like it. It worked pretty well. And we see that the average goal, well, on average, uh, on general, how well they work, uh, iTourist work is quite to the left. Yes? So this, was the system using speech recognition? No. So it was only, you could only interact with eye and sort of mouse clicks. And there were very few mouse clicks. There were on average two, one or two per person. And some of these were errors. <laughs> when they clicked the wrong button. Uh, were these subjects in this second test, were they real tourists or were they again sort of turk? Yeah, they, they were so, sort of, yeah. You, when you are in, um, in a natural reserve in, in outside San Jose, you don't have a large pool to choose from, but yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. But uh, some, some are interns and some other persons. <coughs> so the conclusion from, from these two pieces of work is that there exist eye gaze patterns in human to human dialogue. And we can automatically detect these eye gaze patterns. And they can play an associative role in managing the dialogues with the system. And the eye gaze is a promising channel for future multimodal system. And we can see that future application for, for this kind of work might be, well, of course, any map base or spatial information is interesting because there you have a lot of information that the eye gaze can look at. You can also have like e-commerce when we're trying to figure out what items are the user more interested in, so maybe displaying more of those kinds. Uh, we can create digital personalities that is more respondent to how the user is acting. For example, if it doesn't seem to be more interested, stop talking about that, reacting to new things, or, or keeping a more slow pace during a, a presentation of some kind. We can also imagine this is interesting for tutoring system or e-education and uh, online help. So that was um, my presentation. So if you have further questions, please. Thank you. So um, do you allow the map to do zoom out and then shift? No, I didn't. So I, I used a stable map. I wonder if you, 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 you focus some place or want to zoom it. Um, yeah, I don't know how, how, how the focus is. Yeah. And also, if I even want to shift it, I may shift the center, I hope the zoom was distance to the new center, right? So I wonder if that I can interface would make sense for the user. Mm. The user could also get confused if you move too much. Yeah. yeah I, I think one has to study that more. It's an interesting issue. Um, I don't have any good answers. I don't know. Uh, sort of, of study looks closely on that, so, but it's an it's a interesting thing, yeah. I'm trying to understand why it is that the human um, tourist consultants were so much slower uh, than the system. Was, so, with, so there was no speech involved, so the, the humans were supposed to follow the eye gaze and highlight the hotels or whatever that's near the eye oh, gaze? No. In, in in the first study, they, they were talking, the tourist and the tourist consultant were talking to each other. Right. But yeah. when you did the comparison between the task completion time. Yeah. The, the, uh, well. What was the human's task in that case? So the task is, is similar. It's to provide information 
as well good as possible to the tourists. And <clears throat> of course, what actually is going on that, that you're talking about different places, that's the same. Um, and I think the number of places was about the same too. So it's, it's well, this of course didn't have that the tourist was talking with, which they did in the other task. So. So, so then as a tourist watches the eye gaze and says, oh, this is this hotel, whatever, and then the system likewise, as it uses your, your flow, so your flow chart for the yeah. log management, it's using QTS to generate information for the user, is that right? It's uh, speaking out information about Yeah, it had pre-recorded um, text to, to run in this, uh, sort of a sequence to, to, to run through, but it could stop anywhere in the sequence, depending on it. If, this is, if the user wasn't interested in it any longer, it sort of stopped. Okay, so yeah. why, why is the human being so much longer? Well, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> oh, they, of course, the, the humans had sort of not only to answer the question, but they also sometimes look up the information because they couldn't remember all the hotels and the prices and that sort of thing, which took a little bit longer time. So it's for, for the human to do the same task is much more demanding than for the, for the computer. One, one could, that's one conclusion one could say. Yeah. That's just because of the lookup. Uh, yeah, I think it's the, the look, look up. That's sort of, for for the tourists, the task wasn't very different, except that they could talk in the in the real tourist. Yeah. It's just a question about how you integrate the, the gaze tracking into the actual task that people are doing. So, yeah. you know, they knew that they were being gaze tracked because obviously they had to calibrate the system beforehand, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Um, but as, for instance, if if they start moving their head around and you're losing tracking, et cetera. Were you, as the um, experimenter, was, were you having to constantly tell them, oh, can you get back into center a little bit, we're, we're losing you, et cetera? Was it, or did you, did you not worry about it when you lost them, you just lost them? Um, well, yeah, I didn't, didn't worry about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, and and I, I did notice that in the real tourist study, for example, uh, many of the um, lost eye gazes has to do with that people look down, breathing their task on the paper. Uh, but in general, I used an older model of the eye tracker too, so it lost a little bit more. Uh, but I was trying to, to sort of find general, um, I wasn't doing an experimental psycho psychological study, so I didn't bother about losing a few milliseconds here and there. But more of what I was wondering about is that you could imagine that somebody's working along and they kind of, and then you've lost the, the gaze track. The yeah, person. this is uh, the, Toby works very well in the, in in that sense that that as soon as you come back, you're back. But you have to be back within about this much space. There's there's yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. at least my experience is that I find that I can get the thing to sort of wander off and lose yeah. track without trying too hard. And so if if I'm doing a task, the main thing I'm wondering about is whenever these people are doing the task, they're immersed in the task. They're not immersed in eye tracking. Um, yeah, the, I, I think for the second study we checked, and they say it was only two persons or something that tried to, to sort of adjust themselves because they tended to come a little bit close. And then it, I think it once said that, but that's the, the okay. only thing. Uh, in the uh, eye tourist, I did have a small sort of filter for short losses of um, eye gaze, so it wouldn't stop sort of, it wouldn't affect the phi score and the I score. Uh, longer losses, no, I don't remember the number. I think it was, no, I can't say the number oh, from the top of my head. Longer than that, it's sort of the, the score started to drop, uh, but only at one or two instances, it actually stopped talking due to lost eye gaze. And, uh, 95% of the lost eye gaze was within the, the sort of the filter that I had built in, so it was quite effective. Yeah. Yes? I wonder if you ask at the level of satisfaction level, like some people wonder even though they can accomplish the task with human or with machine, I wonder if they talk about which one to prefer, prefer to talk to a machine or prefer to talk to a human? Um, I didn't, didn't ask that question because they, 
these studies were done with a couple of months in between. So that they, uh, and they were not the same participants in both studies. It would, wouldn't be fair to, to, to do that comparison when you don't have the real life sort of experience. Yeah. I'm just curious, yes. um, so you didn't have any sort of uh, like representation of an agent on the screen or anything. Do you, can you speculate at all on how that might have changed the interaction? I mean, do you have any yeah. previous experience with using that? Um, well, uh, say like this, we, we know that in face-to-face -face communication, we have a lot more thing going on with eye gaze that sort of connects with turn-taking. And yes, yeah, exactly. yeah, and we didn't have that. And it, there was actually one reason why I choose not to have a face there. So I wanted to see what kind of other information is there. Um, it would be interesting to, to see if it really attracted that much information or, or Another question is when it did. Uh, we know that um, when two persons face to face are communicating, for example, over a map or some kind of spe spatial information or visual information, we tend to look much less on each other's faces and more on the map or the, the information. So it's possible that it's not doesn't really influence that, that much. But it would be interesting to, to do that kind of study to see more when is the face attracting the, the eye gaze and, and when does it not, so, yeah. Thanks a lot.